Hi, this is Tim Weber from South Texas College coming to you with another lecture video on personality, this time having a look at uh, trait theory as well as social cognitive perspective on personality. And yes, uh, having now been several weeks into the COVID-19 shutdown, I've even gotten to the point where I do lectures uh, without a shirt, but I will not lower the camera so you won't have to look at the rest of me. Uh, anyways, let's go to our uh, outline. Okay, so bring up here, uh, what we're looking at, there we go. All right, and let's see, maybe I'll just get rid of this for you. And uh, let's get uh, a pointer so that you can follow along as to what I'm focusing on here on the outline. Okay, so first of all, the trait perspective is based on identifying various psychological traits. When we talk about traits, these are, again, looking at the person's characteristic ways of behaving, thinking, feeling. Uh, the traits then uh, summarize that. So uh, trait theory then doesn't really seek to describe how a person's personality develops, but simply is a way of sort of taking a snapshot of where the person uh, ranks on these various types of traits at any one point in time. So examples of traits would be things like honesty, dependability, moodiness, uh, impulsivity. So all of those things, traits. So someone at some point went through the English language and came up with uh, some 38,000 words that referred to traits. So obviously in trying to understand people, there's just no way we can take into account 38,000 different things uh, or characterize them on that level. So some of the first attempts at looking at traits were attempts then to try to narrow down personality to the most important traits. So, the two-factor trait theory of Hans and Sybil Isaac then reduced personality down to two traits, having polar dimensions, in other words, opposite ends. And as we look at those, uh, you see that those two were extroversion, introversion, uh, that's one trait, and an emotional stability or instability. So if we look at this, then if we're able to test people and see where they rank on these two traits, we can get some sense of what they're like as a person. So extroversion and introversion, that's probably a familiar concept to you. Um, people who are introverted uh, tend to be what? Um, reserved, more to themselves. Uh, maybe even shy, uh, tend to be uh, more about thinking of things rather than doing. Uh, the extrovert, on the other hand, tends to be social, outgoing, and active in their environment. And so notice people can be anywhere from the extreme introvert to the extreme extrovert, anywhere in between. The other trait that Isaac then uh, looked at was stability and instability in terms of emotions. Uh, this is also something that we refer at, to as neuroticism, N-E-U-R-O-T-I-S-M, which we'll be looking at later in somewhat more detail. But basically, this refers to how emotionally stable the person is. Uh, are their emotions fairly even? Or are they emotionally unstable, instable? Or do they have a great deal of up and down uh, with their emotions? Uh, do they have uh, experience uh, considerable unpleasant emotions? So once again, people can be anywhere between those extremes. Now, if we know where a person ranks on these two factors then, 
we can sort of place them into uh, these four quadrants here. You might say sort of mm, for personality, uh, sort of uh, mm, types of personality, personality types. Um, mm, for example, if we have a person that is emotionally unstable, ranks high in neuroticism, and also ranks high in extroversion, uh, many of these other adjectives are likely to apply, touchy, restless, changeable, impulsive, and so forth. And research has bared out that yes, this tends to uh, be consistent, okay, that these other traits also. So you might say these two traits sort of subsume these other lesser traits. Or let's say we have a person that is introverted and emotionally stable, then it was found many of these other traits are likely to apply passive care, thoughtful, and so forth. Um, so and now you get four basic personality types, but I think you and I probably would agree that are there really just four personality types? And you say, no, it's more complex than that. It's more nuanced than that but this does give us a little information about people and what they would typically be like. Oh, by the way, the pictures that you see on the left and right, um, which of the two pictures uh, seems to be a person who is more of an introvert? If you guessed the person on the, the left, you'd be correct. That person may be sitting there on the beach thinking about something, that would be maybe t more typical of an introvert. Um, here we have the person on the right, mm, obviously must be the a more extroverted person. And yeah, hanging around with others and active and uh, maybe showing off and so forth, uh, the extreme extrovert. Okay, so when it comes to traits then, um, is this something that is a uniquely human thing? Well, it turns out, apparently not. Some researchers uh, did an experiment where they had uh, students to bring their pets to the psych lab, and they brought them in, and then uh, the students would observe uh, the various pets and would characterize their personalities. And what they found is there was a great deal of agreement in terms of uh, each of the students uh, characterizing the personalities of each animal in a similar way. So it seemed that there was some reality to this uh, personality being, being exhibited in dogs. And so uh, this picture here, uh, you might have a look at that. So when we look at that picture, which of these dogs would you say would be the least emotionally stable? Uh, the dog that is most sensitive emotionally, we might say the most neurotic, if you will. So I'm gonna say, how about that dog in the middle? That dog seems real sensitive, right? Emotionally sensitive. Um, on the other hand, how about the dog that, uh, looks to you to be maybe the most extroverted of those dogs. And you're probably gonna say, well, it's gotta be either the dog on the right or the left. And I think a lot of people, and my classes when we do this, a lot of people say, I think it's really that dog on the, the left, that one there. And just look how friendly it seems, right? It just wants to interact with you. Yeah. Um, what about the dog that is the most emotionally stable? The dog that seems to have the most even emotions. In my classes, a lot of times they'll say, well, what about that dog here on the, the right? Look at that guy. Uh, looks like that guy, you could just do anything to him and he's just like, I'm fine with it. He just rolls with it, you know? And so just looking at even a photo snapshot of dogs, you might be able to kind of characterize their personalities and find that a lot of people would agree with you. 
So when we think about this, that kind of then maybe leads us to the question about, well, just what leads different dogs to have different personality traits? So you might think of uh, immediately that, well, maybe it's their environment and how they've been treated, the experiences that they've had and so forth. I'm gonna say, yeah, that undoubtedly has some effect, right? How they've been treated by their owner, have they been mistreated, uh, all that sort of thing. On the other hand, we'll have to admit that genetics seems to have a significant influence. Think about various breeds of dogs. Are various breeds of dogs known to have certain personality traits? Yeah, you know, you think of, uh, say, German Shepherds are typically thought of as, you know, being very loyal and being very protective of their families and so forth. You know, other breeds thought of as, you know, uh, being maybe more easygoing and uh, you, you name it, right? And so that's sort of a genetic effect. Now, having said that, even within a particular breed of dog, uh, you will find variations. But in many cases, that seems to be a family trait of that dog. And when you're looking at puppies, deciding what puppies you want to, what puppy you want to adopt or uh, get, a lot of times it's really nice to know about what were the, what was that dog's parents like, what was their personality. And so again, we're looking at the influence of genetics. And so when we look at this in terms of people, we're going to note the same thing, that genetics has a significant influence on personality, uh, just as the environment may have some influence as well. So how do we assess personality traits? We typically use personality inventories. So these are questionnaires that a person can be given. And in answering the questions, we can assess numerous traits at once, if we like, by simply including questions that pinpoint those traits that we're interested in. One of the most widely used and researched uh, tests of personality is the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. So the MMPI was originally developed to help identify and diagnose psychological disorders. It is an empirically derived test. In other words, they used scientific methodology based on real world observations uh, to come up with this test. The way that they did this was that they first of all gathered um, a group of people and half of whom had been diagnosed with various psychological disorders and half of whom um, were shown to have no disorder. So they then came up with um, over a thousand different questions that could be answered by these people uh, that potentially might have something to do with psychological disorder. And then after all of these individuals answered the questions, they sorted them into questions that were answered differently by people who had psychological disorders as opposed to those who had no disorder. So those questions were kept to be uh, part of the test. They also observed what questions were answered differently by people having different psychological disorders. So these questions could then be used to help distinguish between various psychological disorders. Those were also retained uh, for the MMPI. So we end up then with an MMPI that has, what is it, last time I looked, over 600 questions, <laughs> a lot of questions but it gives us some indication about um, psychological disorder. So when we look at the results of the MMPI that is then plotted on 10 different scales that you see here, some of these may not be exactly what you might think they are. So if you want to really know about them, you need to do a little bit of background reading on that, what they actually represent. 
but the thing to really note here is that when scores reach a certain range, the clinically significant range, this suggests the presence potentially of some psychological disorder. Now, that said, in using this to aid diagnosis, the clinician today is going to go to reference materials and is going to compare the three highest things that are within that clinical significant range, the three lowest with data that's been collected over many years to see what uh, particular psychological disorders that uh, might correlate with. So can the clinician then diagnose the person as having a psychological disorder? on the basis of their MMPI alone? Question, the answer is no. This is only a tool that aids the clinician in making a diagnosis. To properly make a diagnosis, the clinician needs to what? Have a history of that person's behavior, observe the person's behavior in the present, um, use other uh, psychological tests to also um, to look at that, okay? So there's a lot more to it than just giving an MPI to make a diagnosis, but it can help the clinician in deciding is there psychological disorder, and if so, what is it? Um, how should it be labeled, if you will? Now, the MMPI is also useful in gauging the effectiveness of treatment. So we can give an MMPI before treatment, and then after treatment and compare the scoring on the MMPI, are those uh, scales that were within the clinical range, are they moving more towards the normal range? Okay, so uh, kind of useful, but notice focused on diagnosing psychological disorder. So what about then normal personality traits and the uh, things that we use to look at that, study that uh, most prominently today. This would be tests um, identifying the big five factors. So we had the two-factor theory of ISYNC uh, earlier and psychologists looking at that said, well, that's very useful but really to get a better sense of a person, we need to have a little more information. So they expanded the range of this to five factors. This does a better job of assessment than the two factor approach. So what was added? Well, conscientiousness, agreeableness, and openness to experience. So let's have a look at each of those big five factors. And notice if you're trying to remember those, if you can remember the word canoe, that will help cue each of the individual ones. So conscientiousness. Conscientiousness at the high end, person is organized, careful, disciplined. So they pay attention to details. They show up on time. They do what they said they were going to do. On the low end of conscientiousness, the person disorganized, careless, impulsive, don't pay attention to details, sloppy uh, in their work, uh, they don't show up on time, you can't count on them to do what they said they were gonna do. So when you look at this one, hmm, if you're an employer, um, where, where do you want your employees to be on conscientiousness? You probably said, well, I probably would want them to be towards the higher end of this. I would agree. Uh, that said, uh, is there a point where an employee might actually be too high in conscientiousness? The answer is yes, that can happen. Uh, we have a situation where the person is so conscientious that everything has to be perfect. And so they spend all their time trying to make everything perfect, even when good enough is good enough. Uh, they spend all their time double checking the details to make sure they haven't missed a detail to the point where they really don't get much of anything done. So yes, there is a point to where conscientiousness actually becomes detrimental. Um, okay, 
Now, um, agreeableness is just what it sounds like. So people that score high in agreeableness, they're soft hearted, they have, you know, compassionate for others, trustful, helpful, cooperative, they have warm feelings towards other people. At the low end of agreeableness, you have a person who is what? Ruthless, take advantage of other people, uh, suspicious of others, don't like other people, uncooperative, yeah, uh, might enjoy even harming other people, maybe the extremes, yeah, um, okay. And then we have uh, neuroticism. We might just go back to that. There it is in print. And notice here, a person who is scores low in neuroticism, this is the low end, is what? Calm, secure, self-satisfied, easygoing, nothing bothers them. Person that scores high in, ang in neuroticism, this is going to be their anxious, insecure, self-pitying, uh, having a lot of unpleasant emotions and up and down in their emotions. Openness to experience, that's the long form of openness to experience. Person scoring high in that, imaginative, prefers variety, is independent in the way they do things. They'll invent their own ways to do things. Yeah, so the person high in openness, they like a lot of new ideas. They like to try out new things. People that score low in this, they're more practical. So, you know, they're gonna say, I don't want a whole bunch of new ideas, just show me what works. I'm not gonna try a different way. I just wanna go with what I have found to be work, working in the, what worked in the past. They're gonna prefer routine rather than variety. And they're gonna be more conforming to the standard ways of doing things, uh, also more conservative politically, generally speaking. Okay, uh, and while we're at it, okay, agree, extroversion, we already touched on that, but so person high in extroversion, social, outgoing, fun-loving, uh, affectionate. And they also found um, you know, just kind of positive feelings tend to correlate with that too. Uh, the person who is more introverted, retiring, sober, that means uh, sober in terms of serious, okay, uh, reserved, um, so on. Okay, so here are some <laughs> traits of the big five traits. They tend to be stable across the lifespan. So if you have a person who is very extroverted, as a preschooler, they will tend to be extroverted as an adolescent, as an adult, as an elderly person. Um, it may change a bit over the lifespan, it tends to be pretty stable, okay? And the same for all the other traits. Now, there are some slight trends. Yeah, people tend to get more agreeable as they get older. You might be surprised there, but look into why that is. Uh, people tend to become a little bit more conscientious as they get older. Well, maybe that won't surprise you so much. Yeah, who's likely to be more conscientious? You know, a 10-year-old or a, you know, an adult, right? Um, a little bit, but it's, it's a little bit. It's not huge. Uh, that said, there are situations where uh, as the person is going through the lifespan, there can be a significant change in a particular trait if there is a very uh, significant experience that really shakes them to their core, then you might actually see a significant change. But other than that, slight variation. Um, they also, the big five traits are quite heritable. And they have come up with maybe about half the variance from one person to another simply seems to be inherited. So significant genetic influence on the big five traits. They also are cross-cultural. They've studied cultures across the world and found these traits do exist uh, in just all the cultures that they have looked at. So here is some explanation of how biology might interact with personality 
and thereby produce genetic influence on personality traits. When it comes to extroversion, what they found is extroverts generally have lower levels of arousal. Okay, so they seem to, uh, you know, typically uh, exist in a situation where their arousal is lower. Well, if you have lower levels of arousal, this then leads to stimulation seeking behavior. And how do you experience stimulation? Often you can do so by what? Being active in your environment and interacting with people and things. And so they're going to be more active and interact with others more based on simply how their physiology operates. Well, at least in part. Okay. When it comes to neuroticism, what they found is people who scored high in neuroticism had more highly reactive autonomic nervous systems than those who were lower in neuroticism. So what's that mean? Okay, so that means that these people's autonomic nervous system, in particular the sympathetic nervous system, responded very strongly to any changes that came along. And so these people then, one, are going to uh, find that changes are going to be causing mm, significant emotional responses uh, based on what's going on in their body. Also that significant changes for them are gonna be unpleasant because the uh, strong activation of that uh, autonomic nervous system is unpleasant. And thirdly, they're going to tend to be avoidant to things that upset the homeostasis of that autonomic nervous system. So you're gonna kind of shy away from things that might uh, stimulate that. So again, biology plays a part in these personality traits. Now, they have also done some further study. There's been many attempts to kind of break down the big five into maybe sub-traits. And probably the best one out there uh, has found that each of the big five has dual uh, underlying aspects. And so I'm going to just uh, show you these. Okay, so for consci conscientiousness, turns out that can be broken down into industriousness and orderliness. So industriousness is what the urge to produce something, to have an effect on something, uh, to, um, uh, to do something useful. Yeah, so people that score high in this aspect of it, they're going to be really kind of goal-oriented in terms of uh, accomplishing useful things. And they like to work, you might say. <laughs> they like to work. Um, orderliness has more to do with what? Having things organized in, um, you know, uh, it has more to do with um, doing things in a consistent kind of way, right? Again, a person might score higher in one of these or the other uh, when scoring high in conscientiousness or maybe in both, obviously scoring low in conscientious, they might slow, score low in one or both of those. Um, agreeableness can be broken down into compassion and politeness. I think this is kind of interesting. So there's two aspects of it. Compassion, sort of that inward feeling, right? That, yeah, I can sort of empathize with other people, particularly if they're suffering. The politeness is more an outward sort of thing. And so, you know, uh, doing things according to the culturally approved way and uh, so on. And so notice that uh, you could be polite but not compassionate, okay? I suppose you could be compassionate and not polite as well. Uh, but in fact, some people that score high in agreeableness, it may have more to do with politeness than compassion, um, but others it may be both. Um, neuroticism, turned out to break down into withdrawal. So the person 
avoiding things that might be upsetting emotionally as well as volatility so just the emotions readily erupting uh, when there are various challenges and so on openness openness to experience broke down into openness just you know interest in new and different things and variety and intellect now intellect um, interest in ideas new ideas and thinking things through um, it doesn't necessarily correlate with high intelligence there's some correlation that people tend to score higher in this if they're higher in actual intelligence but it doesn't necessarily go together it's more an interest in intellectual pursuits and thinking about things then extroversion broke down into enthusiasm and assertiveness so notice yeah people that score high in extroversion uh, very frequently tend to be uh, also highly enthusiastic although not necessarily so um, they might also be higher in assertiveness assertiveness is what having an effect on your environment as well as expressing yourself in your environment uh, so notice that this one there's a little overlap with low neuroticism here with enthusiasm in fact there's uh, there's all, all kinds of overlaps but uh, that's one of the more significant ones okay so now what do mm, differences in these things mean well one th way we can illustrate this um, is related to gender differences and so they've found that there are gender differences in agreeableness male and female um, you see on the uh, diagram here that in general males score lower in agreeableness it's about half a standard deviation for those of you guys who've taken your stats and you know what that's all about so it's not a huge difference across the board uh, but it is you know significant and these things become significant at the very extremes um, so if we take say a uh, hundred people just gathered at random in a room, half being male and female, and we look to see, well, who is the most agreeable uh, in the room? We're going to find that almost always the most agreeable person or two is going to be female, shown at this, yeah, that kind of represents this upper end of agreeableness, high agreeableness. So more females up there, almost in, a, in any group. Uh, is going to be females if it's a significantly large group uh, on the other hand if we look at that group of 100 people just selected at random uh, in that room and look to see who is the least agreeable man, almost always it's going to be uh, one or two males okay and so that's shown down here at this end of the um, distribution okay now you might say, well, in the middle ranges, that probably doesn't make a whole huge amount of difference, but the extremes, yes. Uh, the extremely agreeable person uh, might be at risk for being taken advantage of by other people. On the other hand, people that are extremely disagreeable, wow, yeah, watch out when they're around because, yeah, they're going to, yeah, they're not going to be so much concerned about how you're going to end up. And in fact, they may have some sort of uh, un, unpleasant feelings towards other people and readily might move to take advantage of other people. So that's significant when we get to these extremes. And this also uh, seems to play into the prison gender gap. If you look at inmates in federal prisons, you'll see that 93% of those inmates, male, um, only, what, about 7% female. 
And so you know, what's it have to do with agreeableness? Well, you know, agreeableness, and part of that is gonna be if you're uh, a disagreeable individual, you're more apt to say, well, I'm not gonna go by other people's rules. I'll make my own rules. I'll do what I want. And if it's a matter of breaking the law, who cares? Also, people who are at that extreme low end of agreeability, more apt to engage in crimes that harm other people, uh, they more readily will uh, engage in harmful activities, uh, antisocial uh, activities. So notice that, yeah, this has an effect there. There's a, probably other factors in play, but this is one of them that undoubtedly contributes to that prison gender gap. So if you haven't already done so, um, I'd like you to take time out, stop the video, and do this uh, big five personality inventory. Uh, there's a link here that if you uh, have downloaded the uh, PowerPoint, you can just you know, open it and you can uh, press that link if you open the show, uh, PowerPoint show. Or also I'll post that link in the learning module as well so that you can go and do that uh, personality inventory. And what I'd like you to do is if at all possible, uh, get to a computer where you can print out a copy of your results. Uh, if you can't print out a copy of your results, you'll take notes on your results, or maybe what you can maybe take a picture of your results so that you can refer to them uh, for the activity that's going to follow this. So at any rate, uh, stop the video. Do that if you haven't already. And if you've done that already, you can continue. Okay. So. What I want you to do then to follow up on that is to conduct an in a discussion with a friend or family member regarding what you found on your big five personality inventory. So in that discussion, describe the results that you received when you took the personality inventory. Uh, you know, I scored high on conscientiousness and extroversion, but low on agreeableness or whatever it was, you know, um, and explain to them what that means, of course, that means you'll have to know <laughs> what that actually means. And then uh, talk with them about how accurate you believe those results were in describing you, okay? And what we'll find is, yes, you know, sometimes people will say, well, I don't think it described me well. Now, sometimes that can be the fault of the test, although that uh, inventory that we're using is pretty good. Most people find it seems to describe them pretty well. Sometimes they say it doesn't. And there can be a number of reasons. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of one's perception of oneself is maybe not exactly how things are. Sometimes that's when, that's when getting feedback from others and saying, hey, what do you think? Do you think that's describing me well? I don't think that's describing me, okay? Uh, so that can be uh, something. Uh, on the other hand, yeah, once in a while, maybe it's how you answered the questions. So particularly if you were in a strong emotional state when you took that uh, personality inventory it might influence how you it, answered those questions at that moment. If you were to take it again later, you might get uh, a better reading. Uh, so those are a couple things that might produce results that seem to be inaccurate. Uh, but sometimes it's just a matter we maybe are not so aware of how we actually are. Or, oh, we also, oftentimes we're comparing ourselves with the others that we typically interact with, the people that we're around the most. And so we see them in reference to them, but when we look at how you rank in terms of the larger population, that may be different as we're looking at others, uh, larger group. So anyways, um, also talk about what results you'd highly agree with that you find to be particularly accurate for you. Uh, this can help you sort of establish a sense of identity or be part of that process of establishing your identity. Um, then talk about, well, how will your results uh, in this discussion be helpful? 
try to look at how you might use this information uh, to maybe engage in some self-improvement or maybe to understand how, why you react certain ways um, and so on to understand yourself maybe, okay? So talk about that. So do that, okay? Now I'm not gonna, you know, take score on that, at least not you know, at this point where I'm making the video, I might require it later, uh, but do it because you're gonna find it to be useful. Okay, so now, Let's have a look at how the big five personality traits interact with people's careers, vocational choices, and income. So to do that, um, I'm going to bring up some things here and let's see, I want to change what we're looking at. So let's see if we can go here, okay. So uh, in 2017, a number of researchers, including what, Dennison, Wiebke, uh, and Haneke, and others, um, published an article in Psychological Science and entitled, Uncovering the Power of Personality to Shape Income. Okay, so oh, what they did, is they um, had a group of what 8,400 people that they examined and compared people's actual personality traits to their um, personality demands of their jobs and their earnings. So here's kind of their conclusion. This is from the abstract of the article. Um, they concluded in, individuals can earn additional income of more than their monthly salary per year if they hold a job that fits their personality. Thus, at least for some traits, economic success depends not only on having a successful personality, in quotes, uh, but also, in part, finding the best niche for one's personality. Okay, so. I want to point out something here. So what they're saying is, if you match your job choice with your personality, you're going to earn more money. Now they're stating it here as being cause and effect. Here's an example of something I warned you about back in chapter one in evaluating correlational research. This is a correlational study correlating people's income with uh, their job demands and personality, um, we can't say this is cause and effect, but they're stating it as if it's cause and effect. Um, you have to watch out for that. We can't say this is cause and effect, although it suggests that, hey, this might be something worth paying attention to. Maybe they better could have said our hypothesis based on the outcome is that individuals can earn such and such. Okay, so that aside, um, you know, notice this is, we're not sure if this is cause and effect, but it's pretty strong correlations and uh, might be something you wanna pay attention to. So um, then let me take you to this, okay? So here we're gonna look at then, um, personality and jobs, first of all. So it turns out that people who do various jobs tend to rank at certain uh, places on the personality traits. And um, for example, mm, let's just try a few of these. So when it comes to extroversion, who do you suppose would tend to be like, would tend to be higher in extroversion, an actor or a bookkeeper? And if you guessed actor, yeah, actors tend to be higher in extroversion than bookkeepers. Uh, what about agreeableness? Okay, who do you think would be likely to be higher in agreeableness? Prison guard or religious professional? Now, if you said religious professional, yeah, they tend to be more agreeable than prison guards. And you think about that. <laughs> would you want a prison guard to be very agreeable? 
So the prisoner says, hey, let me out. And they say, yeah, fine, great. Okay, yeah, you don't want that. It's not gonna, yeah, they're not going to be prison guards for the most part if they're too agreeable. Um, conscientiousness. Who uh, is likely to be more conscientious? A financial manager who's managing other people's finances or a decorator? And you say, uh, yeah, financial managers, turns out, tend to be far more uh, conscientious on the whole than decorators. And yeah, maybe you've been around a few decorators and you know, yeah, you can't always count on them. It just seems to be kind of typical. I'm a stereotype, but there's some validity to it based on the research about this. Um, emotional stability. Who's, who's got to be more emotionally stable? A uh, firefighter or an embroiderer who puts, you know, uh, people's initials on their t-shirts and what have you. And of course, the firefighter uh, has to be more emotionally stable. And indeed, if we look at firefighters, they will tend to score higher on emotional stability. Um, how about openness to experience? Farmhand or actor? Actors tend to score real high on that. They're always interested in new ideas and new ways of doing things and so on. Far hands, farm hands tend to be more practical and let's just find out what's the you know, way that works to get that done. Uh, okay. Now, um, I thought this was interesting. So what about college professors? Uh, how do they tend to rate on these big five traits. And uh, so notice the ratings here are on a seven point scale. So the highest scores would be uh, closer to seven and the lowest score is closer to one, okay? And notice, yeah, pretty high on extroversion, okay? Um, agreeableness, kind of uh, sort of in the middle, okay? And when it comes to conscientiousness, again, on the higher side, and emotional stability, yeah, uh, a bit on the higher side as well. Openness to experience, um, only sort of around average, around the middle there, okay? Uh, so that's you know, the typical average college professor, if there's such a thing. So I thought you also might be interested in, well, just where do I fall on those as a college uh, professor? And uh, it's kind of interesting. I don't score real high on extroversion. Um, I'm a little bit more introverted than the typical college professor, uh, evidently. Um, although I might seem more extroverted because I'm in a position in public where I'm speaking to people and interacting with them. So it might appear that I'm more extroverted than I actually am. Um, I tend to be, I, I actually score less agreeableness than the average professor. <laughs> yeah, and you might think, oh gosh, he seems really agreeable. Again, that may be sort of, I'm putting on a mask a little bit to be more agreeable, but underneath the surface, I might be saying, ah, you know. Uh, yeah, okay. So. I'm not mean though, okay. Um, when it comes to conscientiousness, I tend to score, I, I, I actually score higher than that on conscientiousness. That's kind of one of my main traits. That's probably why my lectures are so long. I don't want to leave out any important details. All right. Um, emotional stability, um, yeah, probably right in there, uh, maybe even a little bit higher. And openness to experience, <laughs> yeah, I'm way higher than the average college professor openness to experience. I like a lot of new ideas, and I'm willing to un entertain all kinds of ideas and at least give them a try and think them through before I immediately reject them. Notice uh, a lot of college professors, they're not going to listen to as many ideas as I might. Um, so, yeah, maybe you've kind of picked that up in just the way I teach the course. I uh, tend to, what, um, give some consideration to things that many psychologists rule out as not being possible. Um, I tend to look at ideas that maybe have been rejected by many psychologists and say, wait a minute, is there a reason we should give that a second look? Uh, 
um, I like to bring in things to the course that um, maybe are not typically part of the course, I tend to be real high in openness experience. So anyways, okay. Um, so where are we going with this? Well, when they looked at then people's personality traits on these big five, and they plotted them in reference to the job demands of jobs that they were doing. Okay, so what sort of personality traits does that job require? Um, and then also then uh, plotted that in terms of well, what was the person's income? The end result was they found that where the person's personality was consistent with the job demands of that vocation they were doing, they tended to earn more money in that profession, okay? So just to give you an example, and you can download the PowerPoint outline and then link to this article if you wanna look at more of this. Like they found that, yeah, emotional stability, uh, people that were high in emotional stability earn the most money if they were in the high emotional stability jobs like firefighter, police officer, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, people who had low emotional stability earn less money if they were in those high emotional stability jobs, you know, and so forth. So you can look at that. It seems that the match between the job you choose and your personality traits has an influence on how much money you're going to make doing that. So uh, I also included a link to this, um, this website. And this gives you, um, as they uh, tested people in various professions, how did they typically score uh, in these uh, various personality traits? Okay, so how did the average person score uh, in that particular vocation? This is fun to play around with because what you can do is for each of these personality traits, you can click on that trait and it will organize those numerically from the lowest to highest or highest to lowest scores on those traits. So a matter of fact, we'll just play around with that for a minute here, okay? So this first column is extroversion. So yeah, uh, what jobs did people typically least extroverted uh, least demanding in terms of extroversion. Uh, bookkeepers, librarian, filing clerk, farmhand, laborer, um, office hotel related cleaner, I guess that would be kind of cleaning person, uh, accountant, bookkeeping clerk, um, physical science technician, computer assistant, um, manufacturing laborer, crop grower, building structure cleaner, uh, electrical mechanic, so on. Uh, turns out you don't have to be uh, evidently too extroverted. You can be kind of introverted to do those uh, pretty well. Um, on the other hand, uh, what jobs did people tend to be the most extroverted? Uh, actors of all kinds, uh, that matter, film or stage director, insurance representative, insurance salesman, um, official employer, um, a real estate agent, a manager of a restaurant, hotel, business professional, um, composer, musician, singer, I get extroversion, uh, personnel or career professional, um, so social work professional, teaching, um, personal care worker. All those tended to be high in extroversion. Let's have a look at agreeableness. Um, so in what jobs did people tend to be least agreeable? Uh, armed forces, prison guard, police officer, fire, firefighter, safety inspector, health inspector, forestry worker, government, uh, tax official, um, author, journalist, writer, um, protective services worker, doorkeeper, watch person, that's like a bouncer, isn't it? Um, electrical assembler, uh, so on. Okay, so 
people least agreeable in those kinds of fields. Um, on the other hand, in what fields were people most agreeable, religious professional, personal care worker, special ed teacher, social worker, psychologist, um, teachers of various kinds, um, photo sound equipment operator, um, travel agent, uh, personal care workers, nursing associates, um, medical doctor, okay. This next one is conscientiousness. So I want you to notice something, okay? Here's the highest scores in conscientiousness. Whoops, here's the highest scores. Ooh, here we go. In the uh, sixes, notice lowest scores <laughs> are in the fives. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, go on down there. So what's that say? What's that tell you? Ah, <laughs> there's not a lot of jobs for people that score lower than a certain level in conscientiousness. If you haven't reached that level, chances are you're not going to have a job. Okay, let me see if I can get back to the top of the list here. So let's look at the jobs that correlated with the highest levels of conscientiousness. Um, computer services department manager, financial manager, uh, general manager, electrical engineer. Yeah, I guess you want them to be <laughs> conscientious, right? Uh, not mess up your electrical system. Judge, um, librarian, medical doctor, optometrist, business professional, uh, bank teller, dentist, uh, lawyer. Yes, yeah, so those people tend to be more most conscientious. On the other hand, who tend to be least conscientious, Decorators and designers, uh, taxi drivers, mail carriers. That's kind of scary. Mail carriers tend to not be that conscientious. Maybe that's why you get mail that goes to somebody else. <laughs> okay, concrete placer, um, um, special ed teaching. That's kind of interesting. Uh, not so worried about the details. Okay. Um, what else? Um, okay. Uh, let's go to emotional stability. Now they've, instead of using neuroticism where the high is emotionally unstable, they've used stability here. So the higher it is, the more stable emotionally the person is. So let's see which jobs uh, people tended to be most emotionally stable. Uh, whoops, here we go. Firefighter, police officer, uh, detective, armed forces, locomotive engineer, uh, police officer, medical doctor, prison guard, um, general manager, sports person, judge, uh, computer services department manager, financial manager, social work, roofer. Okay, so those people tend to be real stable emotionally. I guess if you're a roofer, you got to be emotionally stable. You can't freak out every time you get up on the roof and oh my gosh. Uh, okay, and in terms of who uh, least emotionally stable, um, seems that you can get away with that if you're cleaning buildings, if you're working uh, uh, with a bleach and dye machine operator, administrative secretary, uh, sewer embroiderer, bookkeeper, a uh, concrete placer, lift truck, that's like a forklift driver, farm hands, so on. So, um, okay. And then getting over here to openness and experience. Okay, let's see who's typically the highest in openness to experience. So we got people like actors and directors, film directors, decorators, composers, musicians, singers. Um, Photo, image, um, author, journalists, writers. Yeah, they've got to be, uh, have all kinds of new ideas, right? Uh, tailors, dressmakers, architects, uh, town planners, traffic planners. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, hairdresser, barber, um, 
child care workers, so on, um, religious professional uh, who tends to be lowest in openness to experience. Let's see what jobs there are. Bookkeepers. Yeah, I guess you don't want them to get too creative, right? Bookkeeping. Um, concrete placer, government tax official, arms forces, uh, farm labor, and so on, accountant. Yeah, uh, not new ways to do it. Let's just do it the uh, standard way. Uh, stenographer, typist, uh, so on. Okay, so uh, that's kind of interesting. Here's the thing, what you can do is you can sort of look at your results on that personality inventory and compare those with where people rank in particular professions you might be interested in. This may give you some sense of, yeah, if I go into that, you know, am I gonna be in the higher wage earners in that particular profession or am I gonna maybe uh, not uh, be as, uh, earning as much as some of my colleagues who are more typical in personality for that uh, particular profession. Uh, it also might give you some sense of, yeah, how much do I, how much would I fit in and fit with? How well do I fit with that profession as well? So it might be helpful in determining uh, what professions that you want to be a part of. Okay, so let's leave that behind and let's then go back to our outline and move forward on some other topics. So the trade perspective uh, was very prevalent and still is. It really has really some of the strongest research behind it uh, of anything in psychology. And so if we're going to take the results in uh, trait personality research, like the big five research, and throw them out. We're going to have to throw out most of the other things we have in psychology, too. So you can't kind of can't have it both ways. Uh, it seems to be uh, something that is real. Now, that said, there were some challenges to this. The person situation controversy, people like Walter Mischel and some others criticize that trait perspective because what we look, what we can say is, yes, even though these traits characterize people's behavior over the long run, if we look at the person's behavior in any particular situation, it can vary greatly from what that uh, trait, um, act, their, how they rank on that trait would predict. Okay, so um, just to give you an example of that. So, Mm. we may have people who are very high in conscientious. And so people who score high in conscientiousness typically are very honest, okay? Having said that, if we put that highly conscientious person in an extreme situation, they might violate that trait. Let's say, that they are in a situation where their family is starving to death and there's no way to get food. Would they steal a piece of bread so that their child could live another day? Yes, probably no matter how conscientious you are, you're gonna do that. And so that extreme situation may override that particular trait that you consistently show. So mm, the challenge to that then brought forth a new way of looking at uh, this social cognitive perspective. So this then picked up personality as being a result of interaction between a person and their personal traits and their social context. So their environment, particularly their environment regarding people that they interacted with. So one of the promoters of this particular viewpoint was Albert Bandura. So here's some ways that the person's environment can interact with their personal traits. So people who have different traits may choose different environments. And once those environments are chosen, those tend to influence those traits. Um, for example, if you happen to be 
uh, have the trait of being very extroverted, you might choose a college or university that had lots of opportunities for social interaction at a party school, uh, because that's gonna be consistent with what you like. Now, once you attend that school, your experiences interacting with others might reinforce that trait or might weaken it. Another example, our personality traits that we have might shape how we react to events. This in turn again might shape those personality traits, reinforcing or weakening them. So if you happen to be a person high in neuroticism, tend to be anxious, nervous, react very strongly to situations, if you encounter some emergency, you might find that you just freeze and you can't function. And so you're gonna say, I'm gonna do whatever I can to avoid those situations, and this then may reinforce that personality trait. Now, on the other hand, if you're a person who tends to score low on neuroticism, you tend to be calm and easygoing, in that emergency, you might find that you actually function very well. You were able to take the lead in helping people, and so you say to yourself then, you know what, I think I'm gonna get into work where I can use that as an advantage and make a contribution. Once you get into that kind of work, your environment may again reinforce that personality trait or it may alter it in some way. Also, our personality traits shape the situations that we encounter. So how we view and treat people influences how they treat us. So let's say you're a person who's very high in agreeableness. So what are you gonna do? As you go around campus, you're gonna smile and say hi to people. And what are they likely to do? Smile back. And they're gonna, uh, you know, say hi. And so you're gonna say, ah, see, I'm right. You know, people are nice, people are good. And so this reinforces your view about personality and your agreeableness. Now, on the other hand, if you're real low in agreeableness, you're, just, you know, you're gonna be going around, maybe you're actually giving people ugly looks and saying ugly things towards them. And yeah, you know, how are people gonna respond to that? They're gonna avoid you or they're gonna, you know, bounce off of that and, and say something negative back to you. And you're gonna say, see, I, that's, I told you people were like that. Yeah, yeah, people are not likable. And so that may reinforce that trait. So there's this interaction between our personal traits and our environments that's pretty evident. So what Bandra then proposed is what uh, he called reciprocal determinism. Hey, it might be nice to have a little pointer here. Let me get that going, okay. So while you digest that word, okay. So what is reciprocal determinism? Well, this is the idea that behavior, interpersonal, internal personal factors and environment, each of these factors influences the other to determine our current personality, okay? So they have a reciprocal, in other words, each one influences the other to determine where we're going in our personality. So what are these internal personal factors that are part of that? That includes cognitions, how we process information about the world in terms of our beliefs, our values, our expectations, what we think is gonna happen under various circumstances, our thought habits, how we typically think about things, as well as what we might look at in terms of those uh, personality traits. So all of those personal factors then interact with our environment to shape our personality. They also interact with our behaviors. On the other hand, our behaviors can exert an influence on these internal personal factors, so can our environment, and it goes round and round. So just as an illustration of this, uh, here we have young lady in the picture bungee jumping. And so how did she get involved with that behavior? Well, it may be that she has 
internal personal factors, beliefs that I'm a person that likes exciting things and values uh, excitement. Um, it might be what? Uh, again, a stimulation seeking personality trait. Um, so that might contribute to engaging in that behavior, but it might also be, on the other hand, her environment. Maybe she hangs around with people who have tried it and so they uh, get her to do it. Now, once she does so and engages that behavior, that can influence how she thinks about herself and reinforce or weaken her ideas about being a uh, person that likes exciting activities. It also might influence her environment that she chooses. If she finds that, hey, I, I hate that. I don't know so much of those people I've been hanging around with. I don't see them very much like them. Maybe I'm gonna hang out with some other folks that are more like me. Okay, this is how that happens. Uh, notice that each of these could initiate a change. So does the social cognitive perspective through the lens of reciprocal determinism, does that suggest that people's personality is a set thing, unchangeable? No, quite the opposite. This suggests that personality can be a constantly evolving uh, thing throughout the person's lifetime. Okay, so one of the things social cognitive uh, psychologists then um, began to get involved with was to investigate various cognitive factors and how they had an influence then on our behavior as well as how it had an effect on our um, environments that we choose. So one of the things they studied was personal control, okay? And so this is characterized as uh, either internal or external locus of control. So where does the person believe, uh, what does the person believe controls the events that they encounter in life? So an external locus of control, that means that the person perceives that it's chance or something outside themselves that controls their fate. So external locus of control means that eh, I don't have much control, it's something outside of myself, whether it's chance, fate, luck, uh, whatever, okay? Internal locus of control, that's a perception that we can influence the events we experience, we can control the outcomes that we experience. So internal locus of control says, what I do makes a difference. External, what I do doesn't make any difference, doesn't matter. So they then studied how does this, um, how does this interact with the way people actually behave? And they found some really interesting things. So they found that people with an external locus of control were more likely to ignore safety procedures than, the, than people with an internal locus of control. And the classic experiment on this, they went to a construction site and found volunteers who were willing to be part of their experiment. They then gave them a personality inventory uh, regarding locus of control and put that aside, didn't look at it until after they had observed the construction workers on the job site. And what were they looking for? Did that construction worker observe the safety procedures as they should? Did they put on the hard hat in the areas that they were supposed to wear that and so forth? After then making the observations, they analyzed those personality inventories and compared the person's locus of control with the behavior. What did they find? People with external locus of control, far more likely to ignore the safety procedures, not put on that hard hat when they were supposed to and so forth. And you think, well, why is that? Well, think about it. If you've got an external locus of control, that tells you, well, what I do doesn't make any difference. So the reasoning might go something like, well, you know, if today's the day a two by four is gonna fall on my head and kill me, well, it's just gonna happen no matter what I do. So why bother to put that helmet on? Yeah. Um, internal locus of control person would say, you know, what I do makes a difference. So I'll go ahead and I'll put that hard hat on and uh, 
Yeah, it might just protect me, okay? They also found people with an external locus of control in other studies were more likely to procrastinate difficult tasks. So, for example, the student with a very strong external locus of control, they might wait until, I don't know, 20 minutes before a major paper is due, they can actually start on it and turn in some scratching on the paper. Uh, you say, well, why didn't they make more effort? Well, what's the reasoning? Their reasoning is, hmm, it doesn't make any difference what I do. Professor's going to give me uh, an A or a C or an F. Well, it's all something outside of my control. They're just going to do what they're going to do. So what I do doesn't matter. Why should I bother to put in a whole lot of effort? They're just going to do what they're going to do. Okay. So you see where this really has an influence on how people uh, do things. And by the way, also people with an internal locus of control were more likely to persist at difficult tasks and not give up so easily. Why? Well, they would say, hey, I can get this, you know, I can control the outcome through putting in effort. Person with external locus of control might look at that task if they don't succeed right away and say, well, I guess it's just not for me, right? What I do doesn't matter, okay? Effort doesn't matter. So these are significant influences on behavior. They've also done studies of self-control. Willpower is sometimes what people call it. Uh, what they found is people who evidenced more self-control uh, did adjust better to new situations, did tend to get higher grades, were more successful in relationships, socially, and more resistant to depression. But what they found is people who had uh, higher uh, self-control also were more likely to plan ahead uh, in tasks that needed to be done to plan them and then execute that plan and therefore succeed and, and achieve a sense of uh, experience, a sense of accomplishment. They found that uh, self-control tended to be kind of like a muscle. If we exercise some self-control regular, regularly, uh, our self-control strengthens just like a muscle does. Although uh, our self-control may be temporarily weakened if we overexert it. Uh, take for example, yeah, you've decided not to eat um, um, high calorie desserts, but yet you have someone who is constantly offering them to you all day long. Yeah, eventually they may wear you down, so to speak. Your self-control eventually may erode. Interestingly, they found, though, that it does seem to replenish with rest. So we just get away from that person who's doing that uh, for a while, just regain that uh, self-control that's been worn down. They also found that self-control developed in one area of life can transfer to other areas. So if we develop self-discipline through participation in athletics or some other, maybe playing a musical instrument, we might be able to transfer what we've learned to do to maybe our academics and studying or to changing some other habit that we have. Another cognition that they studied was learned helplessness that they actually discovered. It's discovered by Marty Seligman, uh, Steve Overmeyer, and two researchers they discovered that when people or animals repeatedly experience adverse events, bad things that happen that were beyond their control, they potentially might learn to be helpless. Now, specifically, Seligman and Overmeyer had this laboratory in which they created um, um, a metal grid on half of the room. So half of the room had this metal grid that they could pass a, an electrical current through and produce a mild shock. The other half of the room had no such flooring, was just regular flooring. And they placed a little barrier between the two sides of the room, brought in dogs. And 
they then would sound a buzzer and the buzzer would be followed uh, shortly with that mild electric shock, enough to be unpleasant to those dogs. So what did the dogs learn pretty quickly? Well, they learned, hey, you know what? If you're on the side of the room with the regular flooring, when the buzzer goes off, you don't get the shock. So if you hear the buzzer and you're on the middle grid, well, quick get over on the side where there's regular flooring and you'll be fine, you won't get the shock. So they would consistently uh, act to avoid the uh, adverse event. Now, Seligman then brought in a new group of dogs, naive, hadn't been through any of this, didn't know anything about it. And they trained these dogs in a harness. So the dog was restrained in a harness, and then they would hear a buzzer, which was followed by a similar shock, okay? And this was done repeatedly. Um, they then placed these dogs, after the conditioning in the harness, into that room. Again, the buzzers were sounded, followed by shocks. Did these dogs learn to avoid the shocks? Most of them did not. Most of them simply stood there when they heard the shock, cowered, and didn't do anything. What did they learn? when they were restrained in the harness. There, when you hear the buzzer, there's nothing you can do about it. You're gonna get the shock. So you might as well just get ready for the shock. That's what they learned. They learned to be helplessness and not do anything about their situation. Now, Seligman and Overmeyer then wondered, would this apply to people? Now, of course you can't do that kind of experiment with people for ethical reasons. Um, that said, um, they then began studying people and found that indeed many times when people had a bunch of bad things happen to them over and over again, that they indeed would give up in trying to avoid future bad events, that they would just kind of become helpless and passive. So pretty sad. Person could do something about their situation, but they just sit there and don't do anything about it. So we see this, and oh, um, by the way, another example of this you may have seen, if you've ever been to the circus, you've seen gigantic elephants standing there, and how do they keep the elephant where they want it to be? Well, they just take a little, a little rope and drive a little stake in the ground, and the elephant stands there. Now, if you look at it and you think about it, <laughs> the elephant is definitely strong enough that they could pick up that their leg, pull that stake out, and walk wherever they want it. So why does the elephant stay there? Well, the reason is learn helplessness. Um, the elephant has learned that whenever they put the stake in the ground, there's nothing you can do about it. How did it learn that? Well, they started when the elephant was a baby. And at that point, yes, the stake and the rope was strong enough to keep them in place. But eventually, what? They never challenge it. So they don't know that they could just get up and walk away. It's learn helplessness. Now, the other side of the story that you don't get in a lot of psych courses is there actually were some dogs trained in those harnesses that did learn to avoid the shocks. As a matter of fact, it was about a third of the dogs. So it's even though it was not the majority, it was a significant number did. Uh, they did learn to go on the other side of the room when they heard the buzzer. So, of course, Sigmund and Overmeyer wondered why did they, why were these dogs different from the majority who became helpless? So they asked the dogs, but the dogs wouldn't tell them anything. So, well, maybe we could, by studying people, get some insight into this. So they looked for people who'd been through all kinds of bad things over and over again who did not become helpless, who continued to work to overcome their circumstances, and they identified one thing that was important in order to avoid becoming helpless, and what was that? To maintain an optimistic viewpoint. No kidding you, I'm serious. So that led to studies of optimism and what it might provide for us. 
and they found that yes, optimism can help prevent learned helplessness. Also, an optimistic attitude correlated with persistence, not giving up when you run into obstacles and difficulties. And they found that people who are optimistic in couple conflicts, um, conflict between husband and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend, if one of them or both were optimistic, they were more likely to re resolve their conflict, continue that relationship, than if they were pessimistic in their viewpoint. Now, having said that, excessive optimism is dangerous. Yeah, okay, I mean, you know, if you're driving down the road, uh, going 100 miles on Pecan Avenue uh, in a car that uh, has bad brakes and bald tires, and you think you're gonna be fine, uh, that's excessive optimism, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, so what they found is sort of realistic optimism was the best, where you were optimistic, uh, being realistic about the situation, what were the possibilities for improvement? And, and almost always we can find some possibility uh, out there that is realistic. So how do we then assess behavior uh, in order to uh, predict behavior? Um, if we are coming out of this viewpoint. Well, one of the things would be to recognize that, yeah, probably the best predictor of a person's future behavior is gonna be their past performance in similar real world situations. So if we wanna know how's a student gonna likely do in school, well, what were their past grades? If we wanna know how would a person do at this particular job, well, have they done that job before? If so, how did they do? Or if we want to know, is a person going to use drugs? Well, have they done it previously? Best predictor. Now, if we have no past history that is similar to what were the situation that we are thinking of, then we might test this by setting up a realistic simulation. Okay. Uh, for example, okay, in the psychology department, when we vet people for new instructors, one of the things that we do, and I've been on a lot of those committees over the years, is we have the prospective instructor, the candidate, actually teach a mock class. And it's really interesting. Sometimes the candidate's credentials on paper look fabulous and really impressive degrees from important institutions and maybe conducted very important research and so forth. But some of those individuals come into that uh, teaching simulation and honestly, they're just terrible, okay? And so we know that's not a person we're gonna hire, okay? Because at STC, yeah, our emphasis is on quality teaching, yeah. Okay, I, I don't know how I slipped through somehow, <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, but notice that can be useful. That sort of realistic simulation used by, say, U.S. military businesses as well uh, to sort of see how would people do in a particular uh, prospective position. Okay, so having looked at all that, let's just then have a look at a concept that is a part of many perspectives on personality, that of the self. And so the self being, you know, how does a person see themselves? How do they think of themselves? And so one element of this that's been studied is possible selves. So as we think about ourselves going into the future, uh, how, what influence does that have? And we also can identify positive and negative possible selves. So positive possible selves who look at the future and look at the positive things that might uh, be possible for us. We might be able to say, pass this course, maybe uh, get through college, get a degree and get a good job and have a great family and all that. Okay, uh, negative possible selves, that would be the potential negative things that might be in the future. Um, Maybe we might look at it and say, gosh, you know, uh, I have a parent that was an alcoholic. I could become an alcoholic. I could end up on skid row. 
uh, I could uh, be a complete failure and so on and so forth. So what influence do these possible selves have on us and our behavior? Well, generally speaking, those positive possible selves draw us towards those outcomes. Um, on the other hand, those negative possible selves uh, may actually draw us towards those outcomes as well. So it's kind of like this, you know, if, you, if any of you have ever drive, learned how to drive a race car, on a circle track. They'll tell you that when you're going into the curve, where should you look? Should you look at the wall? And they say, no, don't look at the wall, look at where you want the car to go. And so you're more likely to get that car to go there if you're looking there than you're looking at the terrible thing that could happen to you. Look at the wall, you're likely to drive towards it, believe it or not. And it's kind of like that with this. If we dwell constantly on the negative possibilities in our future, it may sort of draw us towards that rather than the positive outcomes that we're looking for. Now, having said that, um, paying some attention to negative possibilities in our future might be useful. It might alert us to things that we need to avoid or maybe changes that we need to make in order to prevent those things from actually occurring. But again, I would recommend that we spend most of our time dwelling on the positive potentials in our future. The spotlight effect is something that they identified. They found that people tend to believe that others are paying a good deal more attention to them than they actually are. And of course, this is very evident, uh, particularly people in adolescence, about their appearance. The adolescent that maybe has a blemish on their face and a little bit of acne appears. And they think, oh my God, everybody's going to be looking at me and that's all they're going to be thinking of. And it must look huge to them. <laughs> and in fact, yeah, most of their people they encounter are not thinking of that at all, okay? And even as an adult, you know, we tend to have this spotlight effect. I know one time I was um, using the restroom before class and I spilled water on my pants and it looked really weird. And so I came into class telling the students, hey, you know, uh, I didn't wet my pants now, you know, I just splashed some water on it, was in the bathroom. And you know what they said? They said, well, who cares? So we probably wouldn't have noticed anyway. <laughs> yeah, we tend to think people are paying more attention to us than they actually are. We should probably be less concerned about it than we generally are. Now, um, let's see. How uh, shall we? I think we'll save the topic of self esteem simply because this is becoming extremely long and that's not something we'll be testing on. Mm. Okay, um, we talked about self-critical thoughts as part of uh, uh, negative possible selves, so let's pass that. Self-serving bias, so we do need to pick that up. Okay, so self-serving bias is our tendency to accept responsibility for the good and success that we have rather than failures or bad deeds that we do. And this is very typical. You know, so if I do well on a test, what do I say? Ah, you see, I studied and, you know, we'll point to that. Maybe that shows I'm smart and so forth. But, you know, if we do badly on a test, yeah, well, then who's got the responsibility? Well, it's somebody else. It wasn't my fault. You know, the instructor didn't teach it right. Or, um, you know, the task questions were not appropriate. They were too hard. Um, oh, it was too hot in the room. Um, you know, uh, the person next to me was making some weird noises and they didn't bathe. Just any kind of thing, right? Yeah, we'll find some other reason uh, often to explain away why we did badly. Maybe not all bad, you know, because it kind of tends to help us to maintain some level of self-esteem. Um, oh, here's a typical example also of this. You know, 
when our team wins, you know, why did we win? Oh, it's because we're better than the other team, right? Uh, on the other hand, when we lose, well, whose fault is it then? Uh, well, then it's, you know, the referees, uh, the officiating was poor, they didn't call the uh, plays right, and, you know, or it's, oh, here's a classic, yeah, the field was wet. It wasn't our fault, the field was wet. And I always looked at that one and said, well, gosh, wasn't the other team playing on the same field? <laughs> you know, but yeah, we'll go to just about anything to sort of deflect the responsibility away from ourselves to others, self-serving bias. Now, this also comes in a, across in the tendency for most people to see themselves as being better than average. Now, statistically, that's impossible for most people to be better than average, right? But when they, for example, ask people, do you think you're better than the typical driver out there? Most people said, yeah, I'm a better driver than most people. Now, yeah, you think about that. Um, for one, yeah, it kind of makes you feel better if you see yourself that way. Now, I'm going to say there might be some other reasons for that. Maybe uh, you're also observing what hundreds of other people and comparing those hundreds of people's behavior with the behavior of just one person yourself. So you're going to see a lot more mistakes out there because it's more of people that you're observing outside yourself. But even then, for other things, people tended to see themselves as being better than average, self-serving bias. So there you go. Whole bunch of stuff on personality. We spend a lot of time on it, but I think you're going to find it's going to be beneficial for you just in everyday life to understand it better, as well as if you're a psych major and you're going to go into this stuff big time. So we're going to leave it at that. This is long enough. And so best wishes to all of you. And hopefully we'll get to meet for class again.